Hi, I'm John the MedPod Engineer Termel, and this is part two of the post at my blog, Termel, at yahoogroups.com, titled Goodies in Svetkopoulos Supreme Court Decision. And I dug out the background information of what the Crown told the Supreme Court of Canada was the real import of this case, which you're not reading in the news. I'll go over that in another post later. But this is part two of the Crown's own words. Now the response by Alan Young teammate Ron Marzell. Respondents Memorandum 5. The Federal Court of Appeals decision dovetails with the Ontario Court of Appeal in Hitzig, and any inconsistency with lower courts is solely the result of the inadequacy of evidence concerning the operation of the MMAR program in those lower court proceedings. 7. The Federal Court of Appeal chose to answer that a one-to-one -one ratio is arbitrary insofar as such limitation does nothing to advance the government's interest in preventing the diversion of controlled substance into the recreational market, and actually it makes it harder with more places, right? 8. The Federal Court of Appeals' conclusion that Section 41b1 violates Section 7 of the Charter, B, does not call into question the constitutional validity of the marijuana possession offense contained in CDSA Section 4.1. So, the prohibitionist Crown admits JP says that the MMAR flaw does invalidate the CDSA prohibition, and the pro-MedPot lawyer argues not. Whose side is he on? Of course, being connected to the Professor Saboteur, there's no more need for the Crown to argue that the prohibition does not fall when the respondent has accepted it has not been invalidated. Well, we disagree with Mr. Marzell and his mentor, Court Klutz Young. So, their memorandum dated February 6, 2009, Ron Marzell. Now, the applicants reply by the Crown, and I said, even though Marzell stated up front he doesn't believe that the flaw in the MMAR causes the CDSA prohibition to be invalid, the Crown's last point was, Crown, paragraph 12, finally, while many lower courts have refused to follow the judgments of the federal court case, the B.C. Supreme Court recently relied on the judgments below, Svetkopoulos, in invalidating Section 41B1 of the MMAR, although it suspended its declaration for a year. The accused was convicted of possession for the purpose of trafficking, but was, was granted an absolute discharge because some of the intended recipients of the marijuana were ATP holders. Signed, Son Gaudet, February 16, 2009. So, now for some fun. The Crown's motion for a stay of execution. Here's where they're going to tell some truth about their losing will, what their losing will mean. Words will use against them in all upcoming cases. Motion for stay of execution. Crown, the public will suffer irreparable terrible harm if the order is not stayed. Well, imagine if it's lost. 5. If the order is not stayed, pending the proposed appeal, the public will suffer irreparable harm. Courts of criminal jurisdiction may interpret the order as retrospectively invalidating the offense of marijuana possession in CDSA Section 4.1. And that's Sean Gaudet, dated February 19th. So, dropping their last 10,000 cases and erasing their last 400,000 bogus convictions is going to cause the public to suffer harm, irreparable harm. Not doing anything costs 5,000 new busts a, a month. So, the Crown Memorandum of Argument for their motion for a stay. 1. The Federal Court of Appeals declared Section 41 of the MMAR constitutionally invalid. 2 to 16, grow up concerns. Then 17, this court has recognized that there's a public interest in avoiding harm to users and others caused by marijuana consumption. The effect of the judgment of this court is to jeopardize this public interest in two ways. One, by invalidating Section 41, Health Canada may be required to issue DPLs to producers operating large scale grow ups that are not subject to the prescriptive security requirements that are imposed on licensed dealers such as PPS. And two, courts are being urged and may interpret the FCA's judgment as retrospectively invalidating the offense of marijuana possession, trafficking, and or production in sections 4, 5, and 7 of the CDSA. I said, I also argued that if the possession offense was invalid, the other marijuana-related charges, including my own possession for the purpose of trafficking charge, had to also be invalid. The Ontario Court of Appeal rejected my argument and said that it was possible to possess something legal for an illegal purpose. 
Har, har, har. Justices Doherty, Googe, and Simmons are the same judges as in the Hitzig case. Nice to see lawyers making the points I had made that the learned judges rejected. Sort of proves I was right and they were wrong all along. So crown, point two, the public interest in maintaining the offense provisions of the CDSA. And I said, and if they lose, the offense provisions are no longer maintained. 21. Members of the Criminal Defense Bar have argued that Section 4 of the CDSA is retrospectively invalid as a result of the judgments of the courts below. And I said, and members of Termel's guerrilla lawyer army have been making the argument a lot longer than these newbies. Crown, for example, defense counsel in the R versus Polzer appeal. And they keep mentioning Polzer because even though they did mention the Svetkopoulos case, the guy still got convicted. So that's why they keep mentioning this case. Anyway, uh, defense counsel in Polzer before the BC Supreme Court argued that the FCA's judgment means that Parliament failed to implement a constitutionally acceptable scheme for ensuring illicit supply of marijuana for medical reasons, as required in the Ontario Court of Appeal in Hitzig, and that the prohibition of possession of marijuana is therefore of no force and effect. Since 2003, say it! While the, this argument was rejected by the court in that case, Polzer, this has not prevented it from being raised in other prosecutions. Well, namely all of ours. Parker, Martin, Turner, the Toronto Trio, Nielsen's, even Termal and Pierre Drouet. So, Crown 22. In a judgment issued on February 2nd, 2009, without written reasons, Justice Konigsberg of the B.C. Supreme Court declared that Section 41B1 of the MMAR to be unconstitutional on the same grounds as the FCA in this case, but suspended the Declaration of Invalidity for one year. She went further and on the same ground struck down Section 54.1 of the MMAR, which restricts the number of licensed growers who can grow in common. R versus Baron, B E R N, February 2nd, 2009. And I got the website at my blog, and it's the decision with the highlight, paragraph 127 of the Justice Konigsberg. Adopting the reasoning in Hitzig and Svetkopoulos, further bolstered by the evidence before this court, I find that section 41B1 and 54 1 of the MMA are contrary to section 7 of the Charter. Remedies 129. As the matter now stands, the Federal Court of Appeal in Svetkopoulos declared Section 41B1 invalid and refused to suspend that declaration. The case is under appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. And I went, was. Paragraph 133. The discussion settled above in both Hitzig and Svetkopoulos suggests the admissibility of finding a means by which compassion clubs can be licensed or regulated. I use compassion clubs as shorthand for persons who, once licensed and regulated, may grow marijuana in cabinets for more than one ATP holder. In order for such regulation to withstand charter scrutiny, it must be done without unduly restricting the ability of such organization to take advantage of economies of scale of such uh, carry out research on the efficacy of various strains of cannabis and or other desirable activities directed toward improving access to medical treatments to eligible patients. 134. Such regulation and licensing requires careful thought in drafting. Consistent with the reasoning in Schachter versus Canada, 1992, these provisions, unduly restricting DPLs from growing for more than one ATP, or growing in concert with two other DPLs, are hereby severed from the MMAR. The government, in my view, paragraph 135, will need time to put in place appropriate monitoring and enforcement mechanisms in relation to such compassion clubs. There's, thus, it is appropriate to stay the effect of the Declaration of Invalidity for one year. Konigsberg, J., February 2, 2009. So, wow, another flaw has been declared in Section 54, one of the MMAR that we didn't even know about. The MMAR is doubly unconstitutional. Hey, Michael Muirhead, are you feeling uh, starting to turn optimistic?